Hey guys, Joey here, and in today's video, I'm gonna show you how to get a larger than life sound using backing tracks live. A lot of artists use layers of post-production to make their songs sound more epic. And when it comes to performing live, it's important to bring these sounds so that the song doesn't sound like it's missing something. Whether you're an artist or a producer, you need to know how to mix and deliver these tracks. I'm gonna go over a few different routing methods and how to mix them accordingly. Let's jump right in. No matter what setup the artist uses, the same basic signal chain will apply. It starts with an audio source. The source refers to where the tracks came from. This could be a laptop, sample pedal, or a music player. This will be sent through either a DI or an audio interface. The tracks are sent through this to the front of house console, which is the sound guy's mixer. The whole show will be mixed from front of house, so it's important to make sure that the mixer has your tracks. The approach for making these backing tracks will depend on the artist's gear. One of the most common methods for getting samples and backing tracks to the front of house is to use a laptop and a stereo DI. The simplest version of this setup uses an 8th inch to stereo quarter inch cable. The 8th inch plugs directly into the headphone jack and the quarter inch cable goes into the DI. The mixer can then plug their XLR right into the DI. This is cheap and easy, but it isn't as stable as running an interface since the headphone cable can easily be unplugged. A more stable setup is to use a USB or Thunderbolt interface like the Scarlett 2i2. The XLR can be plugged directly into the interface or two quarter inch cables can be run into a DI box. Adding an interface to a live rig is powerful because it has enough inputs and outputs. The tracks can be routed to a monitoring rig too. I'm not gonna go over how to build a monitoring rig in this video, but having this is a great option. In all these scenarios, the tracks are being sent as one stereo source. This is convenient and easy to mix, but limits the mixer since they have no control over the elements in the mix. If the artist is touring with their own front of house mixer, it can be effective to separate the tracks into multiple channels. This gives the front of house more options if there's a bunch of different elements in the tracks. Backing tracks that have vocals, guitars, and synths can benefit from being mixed independently. In the setup, the artist needs an interface that has as many outputs as they have mixer channels. For example, if there are vocals, guitars, and an orchestra being run in stereo, then the interface needs to have at least six channels. This is cool because the backing tracks can be grouped with live tracks and process together. That's going to glue them and make them feel more realistic. Let's say there's no backing tracks, but there are samples like interludes and bass drops. This can be controlled by a sample pedal. This way will be way cheaper than using a laptop and interface, but you should also still have a DI. In this scenario, the samples are recorded into the pedal. The pedal has a quarter inch out, which goes to a mono DI. The venue then plugs an XLR into the DI box. All of the samples have to be triggered manually by a person. It's just a simple stomp box, so anyone who's downstage can hit it. If an artist is performing on a budget, the backing tracks can be played from a simple MP3 player or a phone. It's hard to sync this up with the performance since there's no DAW involved. In this scenario, it's a good idea to run everything in mono. That way the signals can be split using the left and right channels. The left channel can go to the band's monitoring rig and can include things like click tracks and cues, and the right side will just be the backing tracks that goes out to the front of house. Okay, now let's mix for these setups. If the artist is running a laptop and stereo DI, the most important thing to lock in is the balance. Once the tracks are rendered, there's nothing that the front of house mixer can do about the balance. That's why it's important to take your time when making the tracks. If you're the artist, make sure you know exactly who will be performing with you. You don't want the guitarist to play a solo when it's playing the tracks too. If you're a producer, make sure to ask the artists what they need in the tracks. And don't assume that something is or isn't important to the song. So I've got this mix here. The artist will be performing with a full band and has their own set of tracks for monitoring. My only job is to create the stereo file for front of house. The first step is to get rid of everything that the band is going to be performing themselves. I'm also going to cut the click track. Next I'm going to look at these guitar leads. Since the band has two players and four lead tracks, I need to have a conversation with the artist to see which parts they'll be playing and which parts goes into the tracks. Some of these leads may work just for the album and don't really need to be in the live tracks at all. Now I'm going to do the same thing with the vocals. It could be cool to have a double track for the chorus to make it hit harder. Some harmonies and special effects are also cool to have in the tracks. The last step is to adjust the balance. Since this is the final mix, the vocals are way out front. But in a live show, these tracks would just be there for support. The most important element here is the production tracks since there's no one to play those instruments. I'm going to make a bus for the guitars and vocals. I'm going to bring the levels down until the samples and production is the main focus. Paranoid. 
awesome. It's usually a good idea to put a limiter on the master before exporting a stereo track like this. Venues are loud, and tiny details might get lost if they're too dynamic. It also gives that mixer less work to do and makes sure that the tracks are audible. Just render this down to a stereo audio file and you're done. If the stems are being sent to the front of house, this is gonna get a little more complicated. I use buses to keep track of everything. For this song, I'd have dry vocals separated from vocal effects, the production and drum effects together, and the guitar leads on a bus. It may be useful to have a rhythm track sent as well if both guitars are playing a lead. The balance of the whole session is not gonna be important here. The balance of each stem is the only thing that you need to worry about. I like to put a limiter on each bus to make sure that the level is pretty controlled. This makes it way easier to mix since the volume won't fluctuate from section to section. I also include a click track in the stems in case an artist wants to use it in their show file. If you're sending mono tracks to front of house, there's a few tricks to get it sounding great. The first is to check the session in mono. Most DAWs have some kind of utility plugin or button to collapse a mix to mono. Pay attention to the balance between the tracks. Does the stereo guitar lead disappear? Is the bass way too loud? If there are some serious issues like phase cancellation, then try splitting stereo tracks into mono and deleting one of the sides. This is effective for something like a double guitar lead. An easy way to avoid this problem is to use a mono-compatible stereo widener like JST Side Widener. This makes sure that the stereo enhancements you do when collapsed are going to work in mono. If you want to click or cue track, or you just don't like performing to a mix that works for front of house, then create a second bounce of the backing tracks. Both should be mono. One will be the front of house mix, and one will be the band mix. This works well if the band is using an in-ear rig, or if the drummer has a personal mixer. The idea is that the two mono tracks are going to be hard panned. If you're using an eighth inch to stereo quarter inch cable, then one side can go to front of house and the other can go to a monitoring rig. Let's say the artist wants a click, but no guitars in their mix. I'd have a session just like this. Notice how there's a click and no guitar in the left channel. This is the channel that would get sent to the band for monitoring. The right side is the regular front of house mix. This is cool because then you can do things like adding a count in just for the band. The advantage of this setup is that the tracks can be run from anywhere. A laptop, an MP3 player, or even an iPhone can run the tracks and the monitor feed. These approaches work for a single song, but what if you need the tracks for an entire set? It's worth putting the whole set into a DAW to make sure the levels are consistent between songs. If it's just a stereo file, this is pretty easy since you just have to make sure the limiter settings are the same. If the stems are being sent for an entire set, it's important to make sure that each stem is consistent in volume. It's also important to make sure that the same stuff is being processed together. If the vocals are separated into dry and effect stems, make sure that's consistent across the whole set. If you're an artist, another question to ask yourself is whether you're going to manually start and stop every song. This allows flexibility in case of technical issues or if the singer wants to talk to the crowd between songs. Having the whole set rendered is awesome for doing a show with an exact time length. If you have a 25 minute time slot, playing to a 25 minute backing track makes sure that you don't go over. Promoters will appreciate being timely on stage. Combining a full set stem render with an in-ear rig is an awesome way to get cues, count-ins, and click tracks during the set. If you're an artist performing live, having well-prepared backing tracks can definitely set you apart from other artists. One thing to be mindful of when using backing tracks is the places you'll be playing. If there's critically important stuff in the tracks that no one on stage is playing, make sure the onstage volume is balanced on the PA. If the bass amp is overpowering the PA, then no one's gonna hear those backing tracks. If you're performing at a house show, consider bringing an amp just for the tracks. If you're a producer, practice making clean backing tracks. Check them on multiple systems and go see an artist live after you've delivered their tracks. The ability to quickly and easily make show-ready backing tracks is a great service to offer for artists. Just make sure that you're having conversations with the artists during the production. Find out what their live rig is like, how many members will be performing live, and what they want from their tracks. Not every artist's live show is going to be the same. Do you use backing tracks when performing live? What mix elements do you use in them? Let me know in the comments below. Thanks for watching, and if you like this video, hit that subscribe button. Don't forget to check the links in the description below and tap that bell to get notified whenever we upload new videos. Until next time, happy mixing.